an honor and a pleasure to be here, especially to follow someone as distinguished as Mr. Nair. Today we're here to talk about managing foreign exchange risk. So from my perspective, managing foreign exchange risk for an exporter or for a manufacturer is actually fairly simple. When you're booking your orders, you know the payment month in which uh, the money is going to come. You can go to the National Stock Exchange site or you can call your bank. You can say that my money is going to come in March of 2012 and see the rate. And as long as when you negotiate with a buyer, as long as you negotiate a rate that is less than the rate that you're going to hedge for, you manage your foreign exchange risk. And this is the simplest and easiest way to do this. Now, of course, we're assuming when we're doing this that whatever value of orders we have in our hand is exactly what we've hedged. If we have $4 million in the example of money coming in over a period of time, we've hedged $4 million over a period of time. And we've hedged it at a value that is less than what we think we're going to receive. If we're not doing this, if we're going to leave our receivables open and assume that a dollar is going to go up, or we're going to hedge more money than we have orders for, thinking that the dollar is going to go down, then we're not managing foreign exchange risk. We're then managing uncertainty. And in the process of managing that uncertainty, we're actually assuming the role, whether we know it or we don't know it, we are assuming the role of the financial speculator. And if we see what is speculation, we go to Wikipedia, one of my favorite sites. Wikipedia tells us that speculation is a practice of engaging in risky financial transactions in an attempt to profit from short or medium term fluctuations. And many speculators, it says here, pay little attention to the fundamentals of a security and instead focus on price movements. And we can see speculation can take place in many things, but especially in currencies. Now I'm going to pause here, and before I discuss speculation any further, I want to talk a little bit about money and about trade. Now it's natural for most of us to think that the way things are today is the way that things have always been. And that's not necessarily true. The sum of our own personal experiences is not what history is made of. And if we talk about money, and we go back in history, the Greek philosopher Aristotle said that money should be durable, it should be portable, it should be divisible and consistent, it should have intrinsic value. And for thousands of years before Aristotle was born, and for thousands of years after Aristotle died, money was gold. Gold is durable, it lasts forever. It's all the, all the gold that was mined any time in history is still around today in somebody's possession. It's portable. You can carry it around in your pocket. It, it, if you have a kg of gold, it's about the size of this iPhone. You can go and buy a BMW with that. It's divisible and consistent. You can break it down to one gram. You can break it down to a leaf of paper. It always retains the same values. You can't break it down with acid. It doesn't corrode or rust. And of course, it has intrinsic value. It's rare. You can't create it from thin air. Now, for thousands of years, gold was money. And when there was trade by different civilizations, they used gold. And as those civilizations advanced, they used gold coins. And as they further advanced, and as we had the formation of nation states, we were on what was called the gold standard. And when trade was done between country to country, Either there was an exchange of gold, or as the, current, or as the countries uh, developed their own currencies, those currencies were backed by gold. So that if you were trading from one country to another country, you always knew what you were going to get. Now, under the gold standard, if you were an importer, and your currency was going to the exporter, that exporter had the right to give you your currency back and ask you for your gold. And in that process of importing or spending too much money as a nation state, you became poor. And as you became poor, you then took the steps that were necessary to become wealthier again. And as you become poor, you become 
obviously you become cheaper, you become more competitive, and you work harder and you take the steps that are required to become richer again. And as you become richer, obviously you become less competitive. And this gold standard was the way that the world was kept in balance and the way trade was done. And this continued all the way till the middle of the 20th century. Now if you were born in the 1890s and you had the misfortune of being born in Europe in the 1890s, then you were shipped off to the Great War, what we will refer to as World War I. And if you managed to survive the Great War, you came home and started a family. And 10 years later, as you entered the peak of your earning age, you were hit with the Great Depression. And if you managed to survive the Great Depression, 10 years later, you were hit with World War II and your sons were shipped off to war and your house was probably bombed or set on fire. It was a very troubling time. And in that process after World War II, we needed a new standard because most of the powers that existed prior to that were fairly destroyed. We have the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. He who has the biggest gun makes the rules. And at the end of World War II, the one country with all of the gold, the one country with all the military might was, of course, the United States. And in 1944, um, all of the Allied nations sent representatives to New Hampshire to a place called Bretton Woods where they negotiated the new treaty of how trade would be conducted worldwide. And that new treaty was called Bretton Woods from the place where it took place. And it was not really negotiated, it was basically dictated. And the dictation being done by the United States was that we were going to have a fixed currency regime. And in this fixed currency regime, all of the currencies, the German mark, the French franc, the Italian lira, the British pound, whatever it may be, were going to be fixed to the US dollar. And the US dollar itself was going to be fixed to gold at $35 an ounce. So from 1944, this was the way the world worked. Everyone traded and everyone knew what they were going to get back. And if they got too many dollars, they could go back to the US government and they could say, please give us gold at this value of $35 an ounce. And this is how trade was conducted all the way through the 1940s, the 50s, the 60s. And what happened in the 1960s is that, of course, the United States got involved in a war called Vietnam. And President Lyndon, jo Lyndon Johnson initiated a tremendous amount of ent entitlements, which he called the Great Society. And during that process, between war and entitlements, we had a great deal of inflation in the United States. And countries realizing that were trading with the United States realized that there was a great deal of dollar inflation. They started asking the United States for their gold and said, here, we have all these dollars. Please take these dollars back and at $35 an, hour, uh, an ounce, give us your gold. And a tremendous amount of gold went out of the United States. But if we go back to our golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules, he who has the guns makes the rules. In 1971, President Nixon unilaterally decided to take the United States off the gold standard. So all those countries that were asking him to take, take back your dollars and give us your gold, he basically said, sorry, we're not going to do that anymore. And from 1971, we are now in an era of fiat currencies. And if we again come back to Wikipedia and we read the definition of fiat currencies, it says that the term fiat money has been defined variously as any money declared by a government to be legal tender, state-issued money which is neither convertible by law to any other thing, nor fixed in value in terms of any objective standard, money without any intrinsic value. And if I, if I take out a, a hundred rupee note or any note, whether it's a rupee or a dollar or, or a pound or a euro, how, how does this differ than a piece of paper you're writing on? It differs because it says here, backed by the central government, guaranteed by the central government. How many of you trust the central government with your money? So, we are in an unprecedented time, unprecedented times today. We are, we are living in an age where the Federal Reserve can create trillions of dollars at a press of a button, where the ECB can create trillions of euros in a second, where the Bank of Japan can create trillions and trillions of yens in a moment. And if we go back and look at the history of fiat currencies, and the first one was created by the Chinese in the 10th century by the Song Dynasty, fiat currencies have always, always ended uh, at zero. 
because the issuing authority tends to issue too much when they have control over it. And if we look at recent examples of, uh, of hyperinflation, uh, we have in Zimbabwe, you can see this man is carrying millions and millions of Zimbabwe dollars to buy a lo loaf of bread. We, of course, have a very famous example in Germany in the 1920s after World War II. You had to carry a wheelbarrow of cash to buy your groceries. And in some cases, uh, it was cheaper to burn the marks for, uh, for fuel rather than actually use them to go buy anything. And I have this graph here showing how the German mark depreciated to, uh, to the gold mark. And I wanted to show you this because this is usually uh, what happens with trends. Strong trends tend to accelerate. And this happens in life. You, you get old slowly, and then you get old quickly. You go bankrupt slowly, you go bankrupt quickly. As a company, you grow slowly, and then you grow quickly. You can look at Apple Computer. They were bankrupt in 1995. You can see their growth, and you can see the trajectory of their growth is very, very similar to this graph. Trends tend to accelerate, and we should remember that when we see strong trends. And all bubbles look like this as well. You can go back and see the Japanese stock market in the 1980s. You can see the gold uh, in the late 1970s. You can see the NASDAQ in the 1990s. All bubbles go parabolic. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Something we should remember. Uh, this has been said by many people in many different ways. This one by Mr. George Santayana. So the purpose of the history lesson really is to, is to, is to see that for thousands of years, money was gold. Trade was gold or gold coins. For hundreds of years, trade was on the gold standard. For 30 years, trade was on the dollar standard linked to gold. And now for 40 years, we are in uncharted waters. And, and how long this is going to last uh, is anybody's guess. Coming back to our definition of speculation. We're going to talk a little bit about fundamentals of currencies. Now, when we talk about fundamentals of, of companies, we have a lot of metrics that we can use. We can look at balance sheets, we can look at cash flow, we can look at book value, we can look at price to earnings ratios. How can we do this for, for currencies? One way um, that I like to use is supply and demand. Economists do it with models. This is a graph that anybody will recognize from their 101 economics class. And if we review the law of supply and demand, we know that when you have a given demand and supply goes up, it lowers the price. And I highlighted this particular law in red because inherently this is the rupee. The rupee is inherently a weak currency where supply is always going up. And why is it going up? Because, of course, we have a current account deficit and we have a fiscal deficit. We are large importer primarily of energy, and our government spends far too much, far beyond what it actually takes in. And I don't see this situation changing anytime soon. I don't see India becoming energy in independent anytime soon, unless some maybe young kid in IIT discovers something fantastic in how to use the heat here and make, make energy out of it. Nor do I see any change in government where the subsidies for everything that you can think of are going to end. So from my perspective, when we look at supply demand of the rupee, we have to look at demand. Where, where is demand going to be, or where is the rate of demand going to be where the rate of demand is increasing faster than the rate of supply? Now in the early part of this century, in the early 2000s, you know, we, had, we had the crash and the tech bubble, we had the recession that followed that, we had September 11th, and once we came out of that, we had the growth coming back into the world economy. And Goldman Sachs introduced us to this thing about the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, emerging markets, high growth economies, and, and you had investors all over the world looking to have a high return on their investment. So they came to all of these emerging markets, they came to India, they came with their dollars and their euros and their pounds, and they wanted to be part of this India story and this high growth consumer economy. And they traded those currencies for rupees. They created demand for the rupee. And we saw the rupee from 2002 to 2008 go all the way to 39 to the dollar. From all of this demand that was coming from world markets where investors were 
wanting a higher return on their investment. And then we had the financial crisis of 2008. And instead of return on investment, people were concerned about return on their investment. And demand suddenly disappeared. And the rupee went from 39 to 52 in an extremely short period of time. And there was this talk back then of, of decoupling. Well, we know where that went. The Nifty went, or the Sensex went from 21,000 to 7,000. As I said, the rupee went from 39 to 52. There is no decoupling. All of the financial markets in the world are linked. And if we want to know which way the rupee is going to go, which way is going to go, if we want to try to extrapolate demand for the rupee, then we need to pay attention to what's happening in all of the markets all over the world. What Dr. Ben Bernanke says, what Mario Draghi says, what happens in Greece, what happens in Spain, what happens in the South China Sea between China and Japan. We need to be aware of world events because anything happening anywhere affects us greatly, very greatly. Now, in the, in the 2008 uh, financial crisis, it seemed at that time as if the world was, you know, going to fall off the, uh, fall off the cliff and head into the abyss. And how was it saved? It was saved, or at least credited by many to Dr. Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, who used unconventional methods, as he himself says, to inject liquidity into the banking sector. Now, Dr. Bernanke is the foremost expert on the Great Depression in the United States. And in 2002, while he was teaching at Princeton, he gave a speech where he said that the United States and the Federal Reserve could prevent any future federal, uh, any future depression, deflationary depression, depression from happening. And he said that he could do that, or the Fed could do that by dropping money from helicopters. Now, of course, he didn't have to drop money from helicopters. He had to just go to his computer screen, touch a button, and one trillion dollars was injected into the U.S. economy and into the world economy. And that is what brought us back from the edge of financial collapse in 2008. And since that time, we have been going from crisis to crisis. We haven't really come back to a normal, what they call a normal business cycle recovery. And all of the financial markets have become bipolar. They're like a three-year-old. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're crazy. And we call this risk on, risk off. And risk on means that investors want a return on their investment. Where can they get the maximum return on their investment? And risk off means we just want our money back. It's like a big seesaw. On one side, you have all the equities, you have the commodities, you have the commodity currencies, and on one side, you have the US dollar, US government bonds, Japanese yen, and it goes back and forth, back and forth. And for us to understand what we think the dollar rupee or the euro rupee or the pound rupee is going to do, we have to try to understand whether we are going into a risk on or whether we are going into a risk off environment. Because the rupee and the nifty and the sensex are all risk on, at least in terms of how investors perceive them. Let's come back to our definition of speculation. We did a quick talk about fundamentals and now price movements. Now, price movements is also known as technical analysis. And if any of you read the Economic Times or you watch CNBC, you'll have somebody come on the news and say, if the Nifty goes through 5,500, it's going to go to 5,600. And if it goes through 5,300, it's going to go to 5,200. And it all sounds like nonsense because, you know, what does that mean really? What, it, what technical analysis is really all about is, is looking at graphs, looking at charts, and trying to understand what a price is doing and what it might do in the future based on, based on what it has done and using statistical tools to see how it is reacting. Now, this is, of course, the dollar rupee since, since last August. One of the things that we use in technical analysis, one of the simplest things that we use, excuse me, is moving averages. Now, this is, this is fairly common sense. If something, if the average of something the last five days, which is in this case represented by this line, is greater than the average for the last 20 days, which is in this case this line, 
which is greater than the last 50 days, which is greater than the last 200 days, obviously that thing is rising. If the average, the short-term average is greater than the long-term average, this particular commodity equity is rising. It's fairly straightforward. So we look to see, we look for these kind of graphs. We look to see short-term averages above long-term averages. And we can say in this scenario we are in a bull market for the dollar. And we can see this going up. The short-term averages are all above the longer-term averages. It sort of goes up. It stopped here. It stopped here. And I draw, I've drawn this line where it stopped. This is called a support point because it tends to always go and hit this point but not really go through it. So we call this support. We can see that the short-term moving average never really crossed this particular point. It stayed above. And it continued to move up. It continued to move up, touching the 20-day here. And it peaked, touched the 20-day peak. And then here we see, let me just blow that particular region up. Here we see the crosses. We see the five day now below the 20 days. So that means the price of the last five days is less than the last 20 days. 20 day cross the 50 day. So we can see that the trend here has changed. The trend is down. And then we can use other statistical analysis, something that's, uh, that we refer to as Fibonacci retracement levels. Uh, I won't get into the math of that. But it basically gives us levels where we think when we're in an uptrend where we could fall back to. And those numbers usually work out to 23, 38, or 62%. 39%, 62% is usually a box that we can draw. And what this means is that if we go from where we started to where we ended up, we could retrace anywhere from 39 to 62% of the previous gain. And this is something that we tend to see all the time when studying financial charts. You can go and look at any trend, any equity, any company, in an uptrend, when it corrects, it tends to correct in this box. And in this case, it's almost like it's textbook. It corrected right into the box. It corrected right into this line, which was the previous support. And it corrected right to the 200-day moving average. So if you were studying this chart, if you were watching the dollar rate, you could have you know, pulled this out of an economic textbook and say it was going to go right here before it went right back up. And we see here, again, the shorter term averages crossing the longer term averages right over here, the 20 crosses the 50. And we can say to ourselves again that we are now in a bull market for the US dollar. And we see this continuing again here. Let me just pull this down. Now, I have to apologize. My chart is only through Wednesday. I didn't have a chance to uh, update it yesterday being here at the conference. So this is through, through Wednesday's move. And we could see already that once we had peaked, and I've drawn a line of the peak now, so this is now the resistance point for future, uh, if the rupee ever does uh, you know, devalue again. Uh, we could see that the 20-day here crossed. Now here, there was a lot of indecision here. We really didn't know which way this was going to go. It was just kind of bumping along the same little range. But we saw here the 20-day was coming below the 50-day. It was telling us, even before this big drop, it was telling us that the trend was trending down. And then, of course, we have this big drop. And again, I've drawn these boxes using Fibonacci, Fibonacci analysis. If I take the movement from here to here, and I say 39 to 62%, I get this box. Somewhere between 52 and 53, we could possibly see this correct to if we are still in an uptrend. If I take the point from the very beginning, last August, all the way till the top, then the box comes somewhere over here. Obviously, we don't know where it's going to go, but at least we can think or have some parameters where we think it might go. And clearly, we are in a down downtrend. And uh, obviously, I drew this chart before yesterday, after, after what happened yesterday. We are now right somewhere at 53.50, which happens to be our red line. So again, magically, it stops at the next support level. Now, one of the other things that we can do, quite often when we look at these charts, I mean, 99% of the time when I look at these charts, I really have no idea what it's going to do. And one of the tools that I like to use is, is correlation. And this goes back to my risk on, risk off thing that I was talking about earlier. And, and what I mean about correlation is, here I've used the stock charts. Now, stock charts is a site that allows us to do some technical analysis. It does not have, unfortunately, the US dollar rate as one, of their, as one of their items you can do. But they do have 
something called uh, mutual fund uh, by Dreyfus called ICN, which mirrors, mirrors the rupee, not exactly the same rate levels, but mirrors it. And I've done here a correlation between the rupee and, in this case, the Nifty, the rupee and the S&P 500, the 500 largest companies in the world, the rupee and the euro dollar. Euro dollar is very important because if we are risk on, that means euro is going up, dollar is going down. If we are risk off, it means dollar is going up, everything is going down. So how does the rupee do in relation to the Nifty? It has a positive correlation. We could draw a straight line right here at 0.5. That tells us that when the Nifty goes up, the rupee goes up. When the S&P goes up, the rupee goes up. When the euro dollar goes up, the rupee goes up. And the last one is copper. When copper goes up, the rupee goes up. This is statistical graph telling us that if we don't know what the dollar rupee is going to do, maybe we can figure out what some of these other things are going to do. Because they tend to behave exactly the same. And one of the things, as I mentioned, I look at is the euro dollar. And we can see here, since 2008, when we were at the peak, the euro dollar was at 1.6. And it has steadily been falling in a zigzag pattern. And if one were looking at this in July, and you could say that it's falling in a zigzag pattern, then we're waiting for the zag. Here's the zig. When is that zag coming? We know it's been zigging for a year. And we know a year is a long time for something to be in a continual downtrend. So we're looking for something, some sign from heaven, that it's going to now zag. And we got that sign. We got that sign from heaven in late July. Now there is an art to reading these charts. Um, these are candlestick charts. And uh, a few hundred years ago, a Japanese rice trader came up with these methodology of drawing candles. And was essentially what it is, a red candle is a downward movement. A black candle is an upward movement. The top is the opening price of a red candle. The bottom is the closing price of a red candle. And in a black candle, the bottom is the opening price. The top is the closing price. And the tails are the movements within the opening and closing price. This is a weekly chart. So this tells us to close every week. So here in this sign, we know we've been zigging. We know we've been going down for one year. And what happened in this week? In this week, we started below the week before. We went even lower, but we closed above the week before. This tells us that the trend suddenly changed. We went down, and then we went up. And we went up a lot more than we were last week. And if you were paying attention to this chart, the next week, you went up again. And the next week, you went up again. So that in late July and early August, you could conclude that your dollar was moving up. And if you had correlated the euro dollar to the Nifty, to the S&P 500, to the rupee, you could think, rupee is going to go up. I better start getting defensive in my hedges. I should start taking extra hedges, more than the orders that I have in hand, and more towards the orders I expect to get in hand. Now, I've drawn a trend line here, going back to the way the euro dollar has been declining. And again, I've done the Fibonacci, so this trend line and the Fibonacci box happen to both coordinate at 135. We're at 130 now, so we still have some ways to go for this euro dollar to move up. Now, the Federal Reserve of the United States is really the big elephant in the room in the world today. When they say something, when they do something, everybody marches. And what they do, of course, uh, is quantitative easing. And quantitative easing is basically a nice word for money printing, for putting liquidity into the markets. And anything that we do today, we have to look at it in light of quantitative easing, whether it's by the Fed or whether it's by the ECB, whether it's by the BOJ, whether it's by the Bank of England, whoever it may be, Chinese bank, we have to see what these banks are doing. Because they're the ones that are driving the markets. They're the ones that are driving this risk-on, risk-off behavior. And I wanted to take a look at QE. What has the S&P 500, what are the largest 500 companies in the world done during periods of QE? And I've marked that here in yellow. And this goes back to the crisis in 2009. Now we can see that the Fed launched QE1. We went down till, till, till March when we had that crisis. And then after that, we went from around, what is that, 750 or 800 uh, all the way to 1,200, or maybe 600 all the way to 1,200, almost doubled. 
QE doubled the S&P 500. And in QE2, well, look at that. We went up another 30 40%. And as interesting, when QE was not there, we actually collapsed by about 20 30%. Almost immediately after QE1 ended, almost immediately after QE2 ended. We need to be aware that these central banks are driving currency exchange rates with what they do. And now, of course, the Fed just announced QE3. So if past is prologue to the future, we should see rising equity markets worldwide. And of course, I wanted to see what did QE do to the US dollar and to the rupee. And of course, not surprisingly, we have downward movement on the dollar rupee rate in QE1, significant from 52 all the way back to 44. And the same thing happened again. The minute QE ended, we popped back up to 47, 48. We started QE2, not as dramatic as QE1, but we can see we know that the rupee has plenty of supply. So it, it kind of held it. But the minute QE2 ended, look at that. The minute it ended, we went from 44 to 57. And now we are back to QE3. And lo and behold, we have gone from 56 to yesterday, right over here, 53.5. So we need to be aware, if we're going to be currency speculators and not exporters and not manufacturers, we need to be aware of what is happening around the world, what is being done by central banks, what is being said by Angela Merkel or by Francois Hollande, what is happening with Israel and with Iran. If tomorrow Israel decides to bomb those Iranian nuclear facilities, risk off. If tomorrow Japan and China don't resolve their differences over those uninhabited islands in the South China Sea, risk off. We need to be aware of what is happening in the world if we are going to try to compete with people whose business it is to speculate in currencies. And I will end simply with this. Anybody have any questions? Are you sure you're an exporter? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hobby on the side. When I have a question, can you have a very simple idea of your idea of hedging versus not hedging? Let's just take it price from ground zero. What's your concept of should one hedge or not hedge? Just a You know, I, I think that this is this is very, very complicated stuff. And as exporters and you know, Mr. Nair mentioned this, we don't have much margins. As an exporter, when we're doing costing, those margins are decreasing. And if we start playing with small fluctuations in currencies, it can kill whatever money we think we're trying. We have enough problems managing our business. And, and I would recommend to, to anybody to hedge. And, and to, 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 to when, they, when they get an order, they cost an order at 52. If they're getting 52, 50, 53, 54, whatever greater amount than they're costing, they should take that. They should not play games with what the rupee is doing at all. Any common, uh, I mean, for a beginner, any tips that you have on how to, and what are the common ways that banks will make money off you when you try to go forward? What are the, the you know, tricks that you should watch out for? The banks, the, the banks actually give you terrible rates. If you are hedging with the bank, um, the rate you're going to get is not going to be competitive. If you call your bank, you should do this. You should call your bank and ask them what is the rate for February 28th or March 31st. And at the same time, go to the NSE site, go to the currency derivatives, and see the rate for the same period. You'll see 40, 50 plus the difference in what they're giving you and what they're actually getting. That's how they're making the money. Um, having said that, having said that, I, I don't think it's really a big deal. I mean, 40 pasta is a big deal. But if you book today and you book tomorrow, you might get a difference of one rupee just in the, in the zigzag. So you have to deal with that. And if you don't use the bank, if you do use a brokerage and you, and you do it directly to the National Stock Exchange, um, it, it's a different, psychologically, it's a different ballgame. Because then with the bank, you have your limits set up. You're taking the cover from them with the brokerage house, you're giving them 50 lakhs, 60 lakhs money, and every time that dollar goes against you, your balance goes down and down and down. And psychologically, even though it's the same thing, 
even though it's the same exact thing with the bank or the broker, psychologically that wears you down. And you should be prepared. You see the losses right away as opposed to seeing the losses later. Anybody, anybody else? Okay, thank you very much.